the main work of my lab is split into three sections. Part of it is studying how organs naturally develop, and that's looking at embryology, looking at developmental biology and cell biology to understand how we go from a simple egg to the complexity of an adult. The second part is trying to use that knowledge to engineer new organs. So, for example, we're trying to grow kidneys in culture from stem cells, ultimately with the aim of transplanting for human use, although, of course, that's a long way away. And then the third part of the laboratory is working on synthetic biology. And for the synthetic biology, we're interested in teaching naive cells that don't know how to do developmentally interesting things, how to make patterns, shapes, forms, and so forth. The point of that is that we think we understand developmental biology. If we engineer genetic systems based on understanding and put them into naive cells, if they work, then yes, we understood. If they don't work, which is the more interesting thing, oh, we haven't understood how all this works, back to the drawing board. Isaac Asimov once said the most exciting thing to hear in a laboratory isn't Eureka, it's that's odd. And we sort of live for those that's odd moments. by a simple question about how human organs form. A lot of our organs are formed on tree-like branching systems of epithelial tubes. You can think of the tubes in the lung, tubes in the kidney, tubes in the mammary gland, the salivary gland. It's a very common architectural feature. And if you just take the cells that make these tubes and you put them into culture, they spontaneously make branching systems. Even if you grow from one single, single cell, so they're all exactly the same, you get the branching system. So some cells are leading the advance of branches and some are staying behind. And that's puzzling. How, how is it that cells that are all the same end up behaving differently? And a colleague of ours um, called Celeste Nelson in the USA came up with a theory about this, that what cells are doing is secreting around themselves a signal which says, please don't advance. And cells that happen to find themselves a little bit left behind are essentially in a kind of cave where the signal can mount up, so they really don't advance. Whereas any cell that even randomly finds itself a little bit ahead of the pack is mostly facing fresh, medium, fresh, whatever, and doesn't get much of a signal, so it can advance. So we get this spontaneous symmetry breaking. And that's a great theory. And it occurred to us that we can test that using the quasi vivo system, because the quasi vivo system lets us, it lets us incubate cells with a flow on them. The implication of Celeste's idea is that if the whole choice between whether cells advance or not is controlled by the accumulation of a secreted factor, if we blast flow across the cells, we'll sweep it away and all the cells will be the same again. They weren't, suggesting that, well, as Huxley once said, a beautiful hypothesis spoiled by an ugly fact. And I think that's just happened to Celeste's beautiful hypothesis. And I'm sorry, Celeste. So we chose the quasi vivo system over other systems for two reasons. One is that we didn't want to have chaotic movement of liquid that we'd get in a shaking incubator or a rocking platform or something like that. We wanted something which was controllable and predictable. The other real reason is that a paper with the first author of Mize had published an analysis of the of flow in the quasi vivo system and had come out with empirically derived equations that would let us calculate what the flow parameters would be where the cells are according to bulk flow parameters about how quickly liquid is pumped in and pumped out of the system. And that meant that we could, we could use their data to give predictable flows and it saved us a great deal of time characterizing the system because they'd already done it. For our experiments, controller flow was very important. We needed to know that flow was definitely happening fairly evenly across all of our cells. A rocker system or a shaking plate or any of those things would have created very chaotic flows. Flow is probably not even the right word. It would have created chaos. And that would have been very hard to interpret. Also, our cells are fairly fragile. And had we shaken them violently, we'd almost certainly have lost them. Controlling, controlling flow in the system is very easy. We had a peristaltic pump. It was easy enough to calibrate that just in you know, particular settings, how quickly the flow was, was, how quickly the medium was flowing. And we could use the Mose equations then to be able to determine how quickly the flow was happening over the cells.
for many aspects of biology, anatomy is very important to function, and anatomy and physiology go together. Simple cells in two-dimensional culture can do many things, but that whole idea of culturing cells that way was really developed for growing viruses. It's fine for that, but it's not very good at mimicking the interactions between, between different parts of a tissue. Particularly for understanding how organs work, there are different cell types present. You often have, for example, an epithelial tube surrounded by mesenchyme tissue. The two types of cells talk to each other, and if they can't talk to each other properly, you don't get normal function. Also, in a lot of organs, the tubes are filling up with something, or something's being removed from the tubes. That's the point of the organ. If the tubes are not tubes, if they're not closed spaces, then we're not mimicking normal physiology at all well. So for all of those kind of systems, I think it's important to use three-dimensional organoids or mini-organs. Our next steps from the paper that we've just been working on will be to try to find out what is going on. The flow experiments have shown that it's not actually to do with accumulation of molecules, so we now need to go back to the cell biology and ask what else can it be. For our other experiments of trying to grow kidneys in culture and to engineer kidneys and to make them larger, then our real next step is to go for continued growth and three-dimensional growth. And that will mean a lot of very careful provision of nutrients and a lot of very careful removal of wastes. And that will, that will mean optimizing flow systems.